If there is one thing that you want to take care of on your Tesla, it's the battery pack that famously costs tens of thousands of dollars to replace if it gets damaged or dies from old age. The battery is your Tesla's beating heart that powers every function and feature that you love about these cars. <gasps> and more importantly, determines how far that you'll be able to travel on one single charge before needing to stop and plug it in. But like with any phone or other battery powered gadget, batteries do tend to degrade over time through continued use and charging patterns, which will impact your Tesla's longevity, but also its resale value down the line. So it's for this reason that if you're coming fresh off of say a gasoline vehicle and you're used to filling up your tank whenever it hits empty, well, you'll want to make sure that you follow the charging tips and tricks that we'll be covering in today's video to make sure that you're getting the most out of your Tesla's battery for continued efficiency after tens of thousands of kilometers driven, like with my 2021 Model 3 that has roughly 40,000 miles on it and still maintains a very good battery health. All right, so first and foremost, it is super important that you determine what type of battery your vehicle is equipped with because this will impact optimal charging behaviors and patterns. Now, Teslas are either equipped with an NCA battery, which is short for lithium nickel cobalt aluminum or an LF P battery, which is short for lithium iron phosphate, both of which are used in various Tesla models and even differing trims of the same model. For example, my 2021 Model 3 has an NCA battery, while my 2024 Model 3 has an LFP battery. But the real question is, what's the difference? Well, other than having different chemical compositions, each type of lithium ion battery has different characteristics fit for various applications. And this here chart demonstrates this very well. For example, an LFP battery tends to cost more to produce, but has higher safety ratings and a longer lifespan typically than say the NCA battery, which costs less to produce up front, but tends to offer a superior charge discharge rate, lower safety ratings though, and and a shorter lifespan. But realistically, this is all theoretical and each battery can perform very well over time in the use case of an electric vehicle. Otherwise, Tesla would never have actually put them in their cars to begin with. And for the purposes of these charging tips in today's video, everything pretty well applies to both types of batteries. So there are ways to determine if you have an LFP or an NCA, like through the weight of your car, if you have a Model 3, but lithium batteries tend to behave similarly when it comes to how they like to be charged and discharged. All right, so chances are you'll be charging your Tesla at home for most of its charging sessions over the course of its life. So the first thing that you'll want to take very seriously is to understand how to optimally charge your car and which charger is correct for your needs. Now, previous to the 2024 models, Teslas came with a 120 volt mobile charger, such as this one right here that came with my 2021 Model 3. And what's nice about this charger is that it can be plugged directly into a 120 volt outlet, like any standard one that you have at your home. Home. However, it offers relatively low charging speeds at only 4.8 kilometers of range per hour plugged in, which is equivalent to just under three miles per charged hour. So if you're ever in a pinch or need any significant amounts of charge quickly, this option alone can be very limiting. Keep that in mind. Now, my new 2024 Model 3 did not come with this charger as Tesla has actually discontinued this inclusion back in 2022, unfortunately. However, it can be purchased on Tesla's website directly. And this new version also offers a 240 volt adapter as well for much faster charging speeds of up to 48.2 kilometers of range per 
our charge plugged into a proper 240 volt outlet that realistically though you would still need an electrician to come over and install unless for some reason you had a stove outlet in your garage. Now the other option and the one that I chose to go with is the proper wall connector that yes is roughly $200 more than the mobile charger but in my opinion it looks a whole lot sleeker especially if you have a garage and it offers even quicker charging up to 71 kilometers per hour at maximum output. And for the record, I paid my neighbor who's an electrician $300 to install my wall charger, but expect to pay even more than that if you're calling an electrician, say right off of Google, and even more if you need complicated rewiring or if your electrical panel lacks space. So ultimately, both options do have their sets of pros and cons, and whatever you choose should of course be based off of your driving habits, your budget, and where you're mainly parking your Tesla for charging purposes. Hey, I'd like to take a quick second here to thank you for watching today's video. And this is a new channel, by the way, that I've started not long ago. So if you're enjoying the content, please consider leaving a like on this video and subscribing to my channel for more Tesla related videos. And if you want to support the channel even more, please consider checking out my Amazon storefront using the link down below in the description to shop accessories for your Tesla, as this gives me a tiny little kickback on your purchases. All right, and this brings me to my next charging tip, and that is to consider opting for low voltage charging, such as the charging that you do at home as much as possible, rather than what's known as high voltage supercharging, such as what's available through the supercharging network. Now, this might come as a surprise to you, mentioning that you should avoid supercharging, as Tesla is well known for its extensive network of supercharging stations across the world at this point. What's important to keep in mind though is that Tesla somewhat has to offer supercharging as a way for people to fill up their cars on road trips and when navigating around the city, as it isn't necessarily feasible to always charge at home, but at the end of the day, we need to remember that Teslas are powered by lithium batteries, which regardless of their use case, degrade at different rates based on your charging habits. So other than the fact that I only have two super inconvenient superchargers in my hometown while I actually prefer to charge at home because it is dirt cheap here in Quebec and more convenient. So I'd say over 95% of my charging's being right here on my home charger that I can set to charge between 2 and 5 a.m., which reduces electricity costs even more depending on where you live. In fact, to give you an idea of how much it costs me to charge my Tesla, I've estimated over 64 4,000 kilometers of charging that it costs me roughly $2.25 per 100 kilometers driven, which is much cheaper than supercharging and miles cheaper than most gas cars would be. But that's a bit off topic. Back to charging, you need to understand that when it comes to EVs, there are different levels of charging, ranging from level one all the way to level three. So level one charging is your slowest option, which you would get from plugging in your EV to one of those 120 volt outlets through a mobile charger such as the one we just looked over. Now to note is that level one alone generally won't be enough to keep up with most people's charging needs uh, if you have an EV. But if you only drive say 20 miles or so each day, well you might be able to get by using only a level one charger. But one quick point of caution, try to avoid plugging your level one chargers cord into an extension cord as the wire's additional length does create some extra resistance that may overheat the extension cord. Just thought I'd mention that. Level two charging offers a higher level of voltage, generally 240 volts, effectively meaning that you're able to charge your EV at a much quicker pace than level one, like with the wall adapter that I have installed in my garage for at home charging. And this is generally the type of charging that you'll also find in certain public settings like at parks or in underground parking lots. And I'd like to reiterate here that although installing level two charging capability at home is an additional expense, some states, provinces, and even certain municipalities provide incentives to offset some of the cost here. Like here in the province of Quebec, I was granted $600 for the purchase and installation of 
my at-home charger. And finally, level three charging, also known as DC charging or supercharging for Tesla owners, is going to be your quickest method of charging your vehicle. However, the speed at which it does charge will vary based on the model of your Tesla. So for the Model 3, the rear wheel drive version has a maximum charging speed of 170 kilowatts, while the long range and performance models can charge at rates up to 250 kilowatts. And you might be wondering what this means in practice. And well, it means that for this Model 3 right here, which is the standard range version that I have, even though this supercharger in my hometown has a maximum output of 250 kilowatts, it'll regulate itself to limit the charging to 170. Now, if you're looking to maximize your Tesla battery's health as much as possible though, try to avoid using superchargers and other level three charging options, especially if you haven't preconditioned your battery prior to arriving at the supercharger, as there are conflicting research studies indicating that rapid surge in power to the battery pack of an EV could potentially lead to quicker degradation of its cells over time. So if you are heading to a supercharger, even if you know where it is and it's still very far out, set it in your Tesla's navigation as driving to the supercharger will start preconditioning the battery for an optimal supercharging state. So for most people, this will be achievable as most likely you have a charger at home. If you don't have an at-home charger though, well, of course, this is going to be harder to implement as supercharging might be one of your only options, but you could try to find a level two charger close to your home and use that as much as possible. Ultimately though, I try to keep my charging to at home lower voltage charging as much as possible, which leads me to my next topic. So above optimizing the type of charging that you're doing most often, one of the most important elements contributing to your battery's health over time is going to be what's known as its ongoing state of charge or SOC for short, which is essentially the amount of juice held in the battery pack at any given moment. For example, looking at my Tesla's battery section right here, we can see that it's currently at around 60% charged. And when you go to change the set battery charge limit, depending on the type of battery installed in your car, it'll give you tips as to what Tesla recommends. So for my 2021 Model 3 that has an NCA battery installed, it recommends keeping the charge level at 80% for everyday charging and 100% only for trips on rare occasions. In my 2024 Model 3 though, that has an LFP battery, it recommends keeping it at 100%. However, mounting research and evidence demonstrates that all lithium batteries at all, regardless of their type, should be kept at a maximum of around 80% for everyday use. So that's around where I set my car's charge limit and I tend to charge it up to 100% roughly twice a month to recalibrate. And equally important is to try and maintain your Tesla's state of charge between a range of no less than 30% and 80% at all times, and even narrower if possible, while limiting the amount of total time that the car's state of charge falls below that 30% range and even less so below 20%, which if done repeatedly over several years, research has shown that this can contribute to the battery's premature degradation. So of course, everyone's daily commute will be different with your Tesla and a highly optimal state of charge may therefore not be feasible for you, but if possible, try to keep your vehicle's state of charge between 50% and 80% as much as possible, which will often mean that you're charging your car on a daily basis rather than say once or twice a week, like many new Tesla owners assume can be done. And finally, this by default will mean that charging above 85% or even 90% should only be done periodically when you're planning on going on a road trip. But even still, if you're able to calculate that you'll make it to a first supercharger charger between a charge of say 80 to 40% or even 30%, then try to still maintain a maximum state of charge of only 80% 
at the beginning of your journey. The bottom line here is that a very high state of charge for your battery quite often and for long periods of time is very damaging to your battery pack. So avoid that as much as possible. Finally, one thing that I have done for over four years now to maintain this state of charge is to charge daily, but set a charging schedule to charge overnight. So when I get home, I plug in the car, but it only starts charging in the early hours of the morning. And this can cost less depending on where you live and make sure that you're maintaining that optimal state of charge. If you're looking to buy a Tesla, by the way, right now is a very decent time as they've just refreshed the Model 3 here in North America. And you can even get a thousand US dollars off of your purchase of any Tesla model using my link down below in the description. Additionally, if you already own a Tesla and you need mud flaps, floor mats, or any other accessory, I'd recommend that you check out my Amazon storefront to shop my favorite accessories. So thanks a lot for watching and please consider subscribing to the channel for more Tesla videos like these two right here. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.